Let's talk about some other options since you brought this up. Yes. Uh, we've got, I'm going to read these because I don't want to mispronounce them, although I may. Uh, Mepulizumab, Benrilizumab, and Reslizumab. Um, what is the pathway of these human monoclonal antibodies against IL-5? What, what, what are these drugs? You're talk <clears throat> We're talking about drugs that block interleukin-5. The right. interleukin-5 um, is known for recruitment of neutrophils. Where am I it's, getting it's eosinophils. Eosinophils. eosinophils? Where am I getting neutrophils? Um, and uh, was rig originally studied years ago primarily in hyper eosinophilic syndromes. Like, uh, I think there was a study in eosinophilic gastroenteritis and idiopathic uh, eosinophilia many years ago. Um, and then finally got <clears throat> approved for asthma more recently before actually got indicated for these rarer conditions. Um, I think personally it works better, it works in about 20% of asthmatics because I think most are the IL-4 pathway, but it makes a very dramatic effect on the persons that have this hyper eosinophilic phenotype. And we're talking about eosinophils of 2000 and more, not you know, the studies, initially we did the studies, John knows, I remember he, he did some of the studies. We did the studies, we made a mistake. We did them in all asthmatics. And we, we saw no effect at all. And then somebody got smart. Uh, Dr. Brown did it over 100 years ago. Started looking in the microscope at uh, people's blood and, and sputum and, and said, hey, you know, it seems to work better in people who have a lot of eosinophils. So they went back and studied in people who had high eosinophils. And in fact, it works okay if your eosinophils are in the 150, 200 range, but it works really well if they're 300 or 400. And so patients that have high eosinophil counts, these drugs that affect uh, the IL-5 pathway that recruits eosinophils work very good. Bendril is a map has an ultimate effect on them. It actually affects their apoptosis or their dying so that it decreases your eosinophil count basically to zero. And so I think these drugs, certainly the patient I described may have a high eosinophil count and benefit from these drugs. Each drug has a different kind of, uh, resolizumab has to be given intravenously. And it may be that that's a good one if you're weight-based. Yeah, there's a study you know, showing so if you're obese, you'll if you're fail obese. some of the other ones, and you actually would do well with giving it because it's a weight-based drug. None of the others are weight-based. They're all So standard. that may be a factor. Um, one of them, bezrolizumab, my patients that have problems with transport and getting to appointments, you give it once a month for three months, but then you can go every other month, okay, every eight weeks. So that's a real attractive thing for some patients. And map has been around a long time. It has an indication for other eosinophilic syndromes like Church-Strauss disease, uh, which is a vasculitis. So things that have very high eosinophils, uh, works well with uh, nasal polyps and other kind of phenotypes of asthma. So again, each has their own little niche, but in the end, there's huge cross-reactivity in the sense that patients will respond well to multiple What this drug may, and um, a lot of people don't realize there's probably a connection between this. Some people think it's an epidemic. There's evidence it isn't. It's been there. Eosinophilic esophagitis. And I, I see this fairly, it, we think of it as like the allergic rhinitis of the, of the throat. And it actually can be very challenging to manage these patients. And there is some evidence that this class of drugs um, may be very effective. Does this class of drugs have any place at all in the treatment with non-eosinophilic asthma? I don't Good think question. we know. Do, one do you look at the efficacy, it significantly diminishes as the yeah. eosinophil count goes down. Is there somebody out there that might respond? The answer is probably yes, but I don't think that there's enough, it's, it's robust enough to, considering the expense to use it in that population. Yes, yeah, so it, it, Well, even dupilumab took all comers, but didn't show any benefit in patients less than 150. It, oh, correct. Well, they, exactly. showed, they showed less robust less eff bad. efficacy. Certainly, as you move up, was statistically significant difference. Was not it, it, but these clinical yeah, trials are not that, that large. I mean, we're talking about 300 some patients, and then 
I mean, if it's, it's different if it was 10,000, but it's harder to get nitpicky about 150 but, but versus 300. We, well, fortunately, we have to go with the yeah, data that's understand. presented. You have to go with the FDA so. and the proofs. But I, I, I think the pill map is a good example. Um, oftentimes there's comorbidities and that sort of thing associated with it too, maybe atopic dermatitis. Um, in the past, uh, it's been very difficult to use omelazumab for atopic dermatitis because the IgE levels are very, very high and you'd have to give a massive amount of drugs, which w would be way too expensive. And, it was and, actually and, but first now, indicated for atopic dermatitis. Right, term. so if you it's have an asthmatic that has atopic dermatitis, dupilumab may be the one to go to. So